Let's go before our Lord in prayer. Our holy, eternal Father, what a joy is ours to sing your praises and how great indeed is your faithfulness. We thank you for how it has pleased you to meet with us thus far this week in this General Assembly. And what a privilege we've already had to hear your word taught, to hear it proclaimed, to have our hearts turned again and again to the truth of your holy scriptures and thereby to the truth of the glory and the grandeur of who you are as our great God. We plead with you this evening, Lord, as, as we gather again and we're feeling the weakness of our flesh as events like this do tire us, we pray the Holy Spirit will not let us be distracted. We pray that you will guard us and keep us and protect us this night from the world, the flesh, and the devil that would have their way with our weak bodies. We pray, Lord, that the Spirit of God would capture our attention, hold our attention, and give us the grace to see with his illuminating powers of ministry to us what great truth that our fathers in the faith long ago have confessed regarding the truth of your word and what it is. Blessed Father, we trust in you for these things, and we thank you for every mercy that has brought us here at this time, at this place, at this point. For your glory and honor, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, in his name we pray. Well, good evening. It is a joy and it has been a joy for 14 years, uh, each time that I, I've had the, honestly, the privilege and the honor to speak to this General Assembly. Normally, it's a biography, um, and so tonight is different. Uh, last night, it was such a joy to hear our dear brother, Pastor Jerry Slate, give what I would call a nine-course meal. Tonight... I'm bringing coffee and dessert. It's precisely how I feel. Uh, uh, we, we, we at least needed uh, 24 hours to digest that, uh, that wonderful meal last night. But, um, but tonight we actually are beginning our official exposition of the Second London Baptist Confession. And as Jerry informed you, for the next 30 years. And, uh, and you might be thinking that since my, my, really my whole focus tonight is going to be on one statement. And some of you are going, really? One statement? Okay, till Jesus comes back. We may not finish, you know, this exposition, but hopefully you'll understand why uh, it is just one statement tonight. But I would like to begin opening up God's Word, and if you would turn to Psalm 119, which the last two mornings we have heard two wonderful devotional expositions from Psalm 119. One verse of scripture that I want to read to you, verse 160, Psalm 119, verse 160. Which reads thus, the sum of your word is is truth and every one of your righteous rules endures forever now turn to the new testament and go to a passage that we heard read last night and i want to read just a portion of it second timothy chapter 3 second timothy chapter 3 starting at verse 14, reading to the end of the chapter in verse 17. But as for you, 
Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so reads the infallible, inerrant, certain and sure word of God. Now, I want to turn to our confession. In chapter 1 of the Second London Baptist Confession, reading the first paragraph, Chapter 1 is entitled of the Holy Scriptures. And this is what we read in paragraph 1. Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God, as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and His will which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in divers manners to reveal Himself and to declare that His will unto His church. And afterward, for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same wholly unto writing, which maketh the holy scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. From the point of church history, Baptists have always been known as people of the book. By this identification, Baptists, since their emergence in England during the 17th century, had gained the reputation of being that Christian body within Protestantism whose declaration of doctrine and practice was solely governed and ruled by the Word of God. In fact, the great Reformation principle of sola scriptura can be argued as finding its fullest expression with Baptists than with any other Protestant group. This is why church historian Robert G. Torbett, in his History of the Baptists, made the case in his final chapter on Baptist contributions to Protestantism, that Baptists, to a greater degree than any other group, have strengthened the protest of evangelical Protestantism against traditionalism. This they have done by their constant witness to the supremacy of the Scriptures as the all-sufficient and sole norm for faith and practice. So then, from this Baptist conviction that the Word of God is all-sufficient and the sole norm for faith and practice in the Christian life, it would therefore be Baptists who would hold forth such biblical doctrines as baptism for believers only a regenerate church membership, liberty of conscience, and the separation of church and state. By these teachings, Baptists took the principle of sola scriptura to its logical and inevitable conclusion. They would seek to assemble local churches made up of those with a credible profession of faith where Christ ruled as the head of his church by the revelation of his word liberated from any human tradition or government who would seek to lord over their conscience. But again, what brings Baptists to these convictions is their uncompromising faith in the authenticity of the Bible as the Word of God. Now, in Baptist history, this unwavering conviction in the Word of God ruling and shaping their life and doctrine has never been more clearly and plainly expressed than in the first chapter 
of the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. In ten paragraphs, the doctrine of Holy Scripture is set forth with such unmistakable limpidity that it leaves no one to question where these particular Baptist churches stood as to their confession regarding the origin, place, and purpose of God's Word. But what's most significant about this confession pertaining to Scripture is that it was not held strictly and only by the hundred or more Baptist churches in England who originally owned it as what they believed the Bible to be. For one thing, the Second London Baptist Confession would prove over time what Dr. Jim Renahan astutely asserts as the most important Baptist confession written in the English language. Thus, its confessional exposition on the doctrine of Holy Scripture would be the place where several generations of Baptist churches and associations would take their stand without shame or apology. We see, we see this, for example, in the history of Baptists in America. From the Philadelphia Association in 1707 to the Charleston Association in 1751 to even the forming of the Southern Baptist Convention in 1845 and beyond. The point of this historical fact is simply to affirm that if we want to know what Baptists largely believed about the Bible, then we need to look no further than the first chapter of the Second London Baptist Confession. So as we turn then to this first chapter in the Second London, the primal and most prominent question to be answered is, what did Baptists historically believe? about the Word of God. The initial response to this inquiry is that Baptists stand firmly in the family of Protestant churches as to what they confess concerning God's Word. In fact, if one compares the Second London Confession to the Westminster Confession and the Savoy Declaration, each representing the Presbyterian and Congregationalist churches, they will discover that the Baptists who framed the Second London Confession reflect the wording of these aforementioned doctrinal standards. So Baptists historically are Protestant by principle and thus evangelical in their conviction when it comes to the doctrine of Holy Scripture. But stating this brings us now to the focus of our study this evening, which centers on the first sentence in the first paragraph of the first chapter of the Second London Baptist Confession. One reason this, this opening sentence in paragraph one is highlighted for our attention is because neither the Westminster Confession nor the Savoy Declaration contain this sentence. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, they would have denied it. Far from it. But it does point to what was uppermost in the minds of the men who forged this confession, that when one reads the Second London Baptist Confession, they will know from the start that all doctrines which proceed in this standard find their source in the Word of God. Our redemptive epistemology is revelational. We know what we know about all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience because God has revealed it by his written word. But what exactly is the word of God? Or to repeat our leading question, what did Baptists historically believe about the word of God? The opening statement in paragraph one of the second London says it quite succinctly. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Now, to begin unpacking this statement, let's first see it in its larger context as connected to the rest of paragraph 1. So I'm at least going to cover paragraph 1. This first paragraph in chapter 1 of the Second London is answering the question as to why the written revelation of God's Word is necessary. Concurring with the biblical truth that 
The light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable. One may conclude that God's creation and providence along with man's conscience is enough to bring sinners into the blessing of salvation. But the second London Confession is quick to dispel such an assumption. It expresses emphatically that these demonstrations, however, are not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and His will that is necessary for salvation. So while the general revelation of God, as it's called, is enough to leave men inexcusable as to the fact that God is there, which of course is an echo of Romans chapter 1, yet it's not ample to bring sinners into the knowledge of redemption. Well, what then is necessary to bring sinful men into saving faith? What has God given to reveal man's need of salvation through Jesus Christ? The Second London Confession answers this and does so in three ways from paragraph one. First, God's revelation of redemption came initially through his prophets in a variety of ways. The confession reads, Therefore, it pleased the Lord at different times and in various ways to reveal himself and to declare his will unto his church. Citing Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 as the basis of this statement, we're reminded that before the coming of Christ in his first advent, God spoke by the prophets, sometimes in a vision, sometimes by a parable, sometimes through a type or a symbol, at many times and in many ways. But it was always God speaking. It was God making known to men what otherwise could never be known unless the Lord revealed it. Second, God's revelation of redemption did not remain only verbal, but God gave his redemptive revelation in written form to preserve it from the fallen world, publish it in the fallen world, and inscripturate precisely what sinners need to know in order to be saved. And so reads paragraph 1, to preserve and propagate the truth better and to establish and comfort the church with greater certainty against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan in the world, the Lord put this revelation completely in writing. As good as it was that God spoke verbally by his prophets, yet think about this, for the Lord himself, even this was not enough to establish and comfort the church with greater certainty concerning his will and way of redemption. Thus, in God's kindness and wisdom, he committed the revelation of himself in written form. Moreover, by the means of God's written revelation, the church is better protected against its unflagging enemies, which seek at all times to lead God's people to trust and follow anyone or anything but the Lord. Third, God's written word, being the complete revelation of his redemption for sinners, becomes absolutely essential for bringing men into saving faith. And so at the end of paragraph one, we read that since God committed his verbal revelation into writing, this, therefore, makes the Holy Scriptures to be most necessary, those formal ways of God's revealing His will unto His people, be now ceased. So here, then, is the full context of where the initial statement in paragraph 1 is connected. The Second London Confession is at pains to make it clear that the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. For a sinner to see his sin, his perilous standing before a holy God, and his soul rescue from impending judgment resting exclusively in Jesus Christ alone, such a revelation can only be heard and received from the Word of God. 
This is why the Holy Scripture is most necessary. But with the context of paragraph one explained, let's now draw in to the content of its opening statement and consider more carefully how it answers our leading question. What did Baptists historically believe about the Word of God? In the first place, they believed the Word of God is Holy Scripture. They believed it is Holy Scripture. The emphasis here is on the word holy. The Bible is not just any other book. It is peculiar, peerless, unique, and set apart from all other literature. There are no writings in all of human history like the Word of God, nor will there ever be. This is why it's holy scripture. Nearly 40 human authors wrote its content over 1,500 years in three different languages on three different continents, yet none of these writers composed any part of this literature by their own intelligence or wisdom, nor representing a single culture's narrow perspective on religion. Rather, what they wrote was divinely inspired. They wrote, as 2 Peter 1.21 attests, from God. They wrote from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is why the claim of Scripture itself is that all its writings are theopneustos, breathed out by God. And due to this exclusively divine source for the content of Holy Scripture, its testimony is concrete, consistent, and unified as it has been delivered throughout all history to the nations. So for our Baptist forebearers, when they confessed their conviction about the Bible, they declared first and foremost that it's holy scripture. It's holy scripture. In the second place, they believe the word of God is to be the only rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. What must capture our attention from this statement at the beginning is that the second London describes the word of God as the rule. It is the rule. The, the term rule is understood as something which regulates or guides. To call God's word then the rule is to point to the fact that God's written revelation guides and regulates our lives in a very certain course. Specifically, it guides us into all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. So it's not just any kind of knowledge, faith, and obedience, which God's word guides us in, but rather it is strictly that knowledge, faith, and obedience which makes us wise for salvation as 2 Timothy 3, 15 contends. Keeping this fact before us then, the Second London Confession describes the Word of God as the only rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. It's not just the rule, but it's the only rule. There's no other source. Listen, there's no other source which can be claimed to guide guilty sinners into a right standing with holy God than God's own holy word. All other sources of religious authority are excluded. This is why the writers of the Second London expounded further on this truth in paragraph 6 here in chapter 1 when they expressed, The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for His own glory Man's salvation, faith in life, is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scriptures, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the Spirit or traditions of men. To apply this to our own times, the popular claim for the continuation of prophetic revelations and the employment of religious methods not warranted by Scripture are canceled. 
by God's written word as having any authority or legitimacy. Listen to this. There is no further knowledge we need about God, man, and redemption than what God himself has given us by his written word. Thus, when the Holy Spirit illuminates our understanding, he doesn't give us a new revelation but rather he opens our hearts to receive what's already been written in Holy Scripture. Hence, the Second London Confession maintains rightly, again, in paragraph 6, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things as are revealed in the Word. So then, we need the Holy Spirit to give us understanding. But what he enables us to understand are only such things as are revealed in the Word. In light of this, therefore, it should not surprise us that the third term used to qualify God's Word as the only rule for all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience, is the term sufficient. Sufficient. Impregnated in this description, as it relates to God's written word, is that nothing can be added or taken away from what God has revealed as his holy scripture. Furthermore, to claim holy scripture as the only sufficient rule means that everything needing to be said as to what we must believe pertaining to all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience is revealed with finality and to completion. In addition to this, since the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient rule for redemptive knowledge, then it must be concluded that God has nothing more to say at this time, on this side of glory, than what he has breathed out as his written word. One germane example to this truth about the sufficiency of God's word is in the matter of how God is to be worshipped. For most churches in our day, God's worship is reduced to how cool, hip, and clever we can make it to appease a world that isn't seeking God in the first place. What God's Word says about worship never figures in this equation. But for the Baptist churches originally confessing the Second London, and for all generations preceding them confessing the same, when it comes to how we worship God, it is only by what God's word regulates via his clear commands and nothing else. In other words, standing in the stream of truth confessed by the second London, if what is called worship is not mandated explicitly by Holy Scripture, then it is not practiced. So then, in a given worship service on the Lord's Day, local visible church, what you should find carried out in obedience to God's Word is the reading, singing, preaching, and hearing of God's Word combined with corporate prayer and the administration of the Lord's Supper and baptism. And undergirding both this practice and conviction concerning how God is to be worshipped is the unwavering confidence in the sufficiency of God's written Word. Nothing is to be added or taken away from how God has regulated his worship by his word. This means, therefore, that God has not left it, he, listen, he has not left us to figure out how he's to be worshipped. But he has commanded us what he expects for the worship we render to him. We worship God then only in the way he has taught us by his word. So neither my creativity nor the culture at large are the index the church uses 
to navigate what worshiping God is supposed to be. God isn't looking for our innovation. Remember the sons of Aaron. But he's expecting our obedience when it comes to worshiping him. Or, to say it the way the Second London confesses it, in chapter 22, in paragraph 1, God may not be worshipped by any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. And again, this is because the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient rule to guide us in the right way to worship the Lord. In the fourth place, what our Baptist forebears believed about the Word of God, as framed in the second London, is that the Holy Scripture is the only certain rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. The emphasis here is obviously on the term certain. This word is conveying the strong conviction that since the Holy Scripture is breathed out by God, then there is nothing misleading or in error as to the contents of all that is written in the 66 books it contains. In other words, there are no falsehoods or contradictions in anything which God divinely inspired his prophets and apostles to pen as the Holy Scripture. This claim in the second London as to the certainty or absolute trustworthiness of God's written word as being entirely free from error in its full content and merely echoing what the Bible itself claims, the Word of God tells us, such as in Psalm 119 and verse 160, the sum of your word is truth. Or Proverbs 30 and verse 5, every word of God proves true. What God's own Word is calling us to settle about His written revelation is that it always tells the truth and it always tells the truth concerning everything it speaks about. This fact as to the character of Holy Scripture is what we identify in our day as inerrancy. We confess the Bible is the inerrant Word of God. By this term then, we're saying that nothing in Scripture fails to represent reality accurately. God's holy word is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, understanding the meaning behind the term certain as applied to Holy Scripture, we must take special note to how this word is connected to the Bible as the only rule for all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. The writers of the Second London Confession are pointing us to see and acknowledge that there is no other competent, reliable, accurate, and honest guide to reveal the truth about God and His redeeming grace in Christ than what we read in Holy Scripture. It's the only unerring rule we have for redemptive knowledge. Thus, everything the Bible tells us and shows about all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience, we can bank our entire life upon as wholly certain. In the fifth and final place, this opening statement in paragraph 1 of chapter 1 in the Second London tells us that the Holy Scripture is the only infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. The operative word for our attention here is the term infallible. Where the word certain underscores the fact that Holy Scripture is completely without error, infallible is telling us that it's impossible for there to be errors. In fact, as Tom Nettles maintains, infallible is far stronger than certain or unerring in that it communicates a theoretical impossibility of committing error. Illustrating this difference, Dr. Nettles said, a person 
may score 100% on an exam in English. On that particular exam, the person was certain or inerrant. However, that does not indicate that the person is incapable of missing a question on an exam. Thus, some writing could be certain without being necessarily infallible. But, listen to this, but infallibility, the inability to err, does guarantee certainty. So for our Baptist forebearers, it was not enough to claim the inerrancy of Holy Scripture. Since the Bible is God's word, God, who is incapable of lying, then the certainty of all biblical content is undergirded by its unachievable prospect to err. Thus, in this first statement of the first paragraph of the Second London Baptist Confession on Holy Scripture, there is no evidence that these fellow Baptists and their, church, and their churches nurtured a single reservation about the altogether flawless, unerring nature of the Word of God. They confess the truth of what the Bible really is as the Holy Scripture, which is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. And here tonight, as Baptist, 333 years later, we take our stand on a good and solid confession concerning Holy Scripture. With our Baptist forebearers, we say also that it is the only sufficient, certain, an infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Here, we remain unmoved by the latest religious fads or the claims of new revelation or the increasing pressure of a postmodern culture that calls us to abandon divine truth for hopeless uncertainty. Here, on Holy Scripture, we stake all our faith and practice here. Here, we take heed to that exhortation that C.H. Spurgeon gave to his own congregation at the Metropolitan Tabernacle when he said, simply but powerfully, be walking by here, we stake our claim. And beloved, what more could we want or need? God has given us his word. He's given us his word. The only rule for our redemption in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Our Holy Father, we thank you for this treasure that is your holy word. We thank you for entrusting your precious scriptures to us. Forgive us, Lord, for the many, many times we have taken your word for granted and how often we fall short in living in accord with the standard it sets, that unchanging standard and how you have called us as your people to live for your glory in this fallen world. 
But Father, by your grace working in our hearts, we renew our conviction, our confession. We renew our stand upon your holy scriptures as the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. Work in us, Lord, a greater sanctification for greater faithfulness to all that your word calls us to and to the glory that it reveals to us concerning the greatness and the grandeur of your infinite character, our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These things we humbly ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and for his blessed sake. Amen.